Greetings and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss the topics relating to R. Kelly and his upcoming trials, his life situations, and coming appeals. Today, we are in the realm of almost winter solstice. It is December the 20th. Um, and I'm super excited because, uh, you know, we should be hearing something on the docket very soon. The 21st was the due date for attorney Jennifer Bonjean to have filed any rebuttals to the post-trial motions or any requests that she would like Lennon Weber to uh, consider. Um, sentencing is February 23rd, so um, I guess they've changed the dates and I have not heard any updates on that so i will definitely keep you posted thank you so much for being here r kelly appeal tv so i do want to share something um relative you know uh, marvin gay has been popping up in my uh areas of, of videos and i ran into a rare um i ran into a rare uh autobiography of him and I want to share that with you but that's going to be later tonight I'm going to talk about how you know Robert Sylvester Kelly was not the only singer in the world to have ever dated a young woman um you know and and to have been you know embracing that you know of course I had a a deja vu moment when I said and I don't know how people are going to take this or not Kelly Nation but I said that no one wants a stale piece of bread, you know what I mean? Um, to be a younger individual, um, especially to an entertainer, it was not, it is not, not, it is, I just feel like, you know, everyone has their own um, ways of liking things, doing things, experiencing things. Um, I'm not saying either way that, Robert Sylvester Kelly has committed any type of, of, you know, I believe that Robert Sylvester Kelly has been just as human as everyone else. And no matter what addiction or if there, if we will want to call it that, if we would want to call it that no addiction at all, um, can be determined by another person or another societal member. Everyone has their weaknesses and everyone has their flaws and no one is above God's law, you know, and, and so with that, he's always been humble enough to ask for prayers and ask for support. And, um, I think he was just being human. And when you're 17, you know, that's still minor, if you will. Um, and so anyway, there was another artist that, um, was given a negative image and i'm going to let you hear the um this rare footage of uh marvin gay and he had some beautiful music you know god rest his soul and his young wife who just passed away as of seven days ago five days ago i think and we're going to talk about that and we're going to connect and compare how robert sylvester kelly's situation looks similar to that. But today we've moved into the universal messaging, uh, belief in self card number six. Now, when we talk about the belief in self from the universal messaging Oracle program, I want to talk about how the eye of consciousness is all about higher thinking. This is how I was able to relate and compare and contrast the differences between people such as Donnie Hathaway, Marvin Gaye, Robert Sylvester Kelly, um, and even thinking about, you know, what are these people thinking that were so adamant about the women in the docuseries and how they're coming up with the misconceptions and, you know, miscommunication of things that they've said. They're trying to rebut what they've said. But yet the Me Too movement, which started all of this, is saying nothing at all, is saying nothing about the you know, the lies that are being brought up about these individuals while they're in the process of being re-interviewed. And so when the eye of consciousness 
is all about higher thinking we see through these misconceptions. Imagine having a knowledge base to will oneself into areas of getting better from just the thought that we're feeling about ourselves. Consciousness is all about the universal understanding that we are worth every positive thought that we can imagine for ourselves. Robert Sylvester Kelly is known for the rise to make others feel good. That's how he was able to feel so many arenas, sold out concerts, because he looked above his horizons and he noted that he was more in tune with the reality that most had for had forgot about within themselves. You know, he's doing this very same thing today during his legal cases. That's why his cases are at a standstill because things are getting worked out. So even as an incarcerated person, he Robert Sylvester Kelly is looking beyond his horizon to find that eye of consciousness. And Kelly Nation, there was a question regarding Tarana Burke and why she is not coming out about those women who were caught in the lies against Robert Sylvester Kelly in the docuseries that she was the one started. She was the, the activist that started it. Why is she so quiet at this point The as, as the Me Too movement catalyst? I mean, she was the the power behind the Me Too movement, the pioneer of brown and black girls. While we are discussing in the chat about what we feel about Tarana Burke, we're going to move into the positive, positive opposition or position, not opposition, but the, the positive, positive six position to the belief in self card titled the hippocampus. So you know how when you go to a university, they use things like university, they use things like campus, they use things like, you know, so the, the hippo is this big, big animal, right? This, this big whale or whatever, hippo. <laughs> so when you put the hippo together with the campus, it's a wide expansion of the universal aspect of the conscious mind and the things in which we consider within emotional responses, psychological areas of sensitivity. So in this inner universal higher spirit of the self, some may call this energy, that's what we are vibing off of. It's to allow us to move, to be, to breathe, to think consciously, to be effective, to make decisions. The consciousness, the campus of the mind does this thing. And there's a part of the brain called the hippocampus. And it's the higher level of conscious thinking. And so it, it helps us make the rational decisions of what is just, just, just right, morality, okay? Within this area, we may be looking at the concept of Robert Sylvester Kelly and finding this midpoint to the thought of where is his consciousness at right now? When we are awakened, when Robert awakened to what has happened in his life, it was time for him to do footwork. And I believe he started long before the convictions, okay? But it's about being better than what we found ourselves at the time we awakened. So the performance gets greater. It's time for us to level up, more or less. It would be remarkable, remarkable to see how Robert Sylvester Kelly will level up from this point in his life. How many people think that he has what it takes in order to level up, to become greater than what he was before he went in? Robert Sylvester Kelly, it may be difficult for him to get through these passages, but it's going to be easier to manage from all the other experiences that he's encountered. The rough, harsh, cruelness of life that people have shown him, that he's found himself in, or that we found ourselves in. Think about the reality, the harsh awakening of the eye of consciousness when we awaken to things. 
such as the true meaning of life. You know, we're getting ready to hit this season called Christmas. Um, and there's a lot of rituals being done during this time of the year to just keep people empowered with financial abundance. Um, and, and, and while others are trying to starve in order to keep up with the Joneses or whatever you want to call them. And it's so amazing how the story behind this time in this life, you have two, two stories you can, you can actually tell. You can tell one that was, you know, about this man who comes down the chimney and does all this other stuff and, you know, whatever. But if in the hood, if we see somebody coming down our chimney, we about to go off on them because what the hell are you doing in my house? So I don't know if that's something that I would still be telling my children. I didn't tell it to my children who are in their 30s at this point. Even when they were younger, I was Santa because I worked hard to get them what they wanted, what they needed, and to be the parent throughout the year to do as well. Then you have this second story where you have this, this uh, um, man who came, this little baby who came in a manger to save the world and we're still suffering today. So at what point you can make the story however you want to make it, but no one's coming to save us, I don't believe. And because if they were coming to save us, many things would not occur and the choices in which we make would not hold the consequences if someone was coming to save us. So Kelly Nation, it's about that hypocampus is to create the belief in ourselves that we mature in higher areas of thought and awareness when we become uh, from one state to another. When I said last time, Kelly Nation in Card 5, if we want to be a teacher, then all we have to do is walk the walk, meet the teachers, study the teachers, desire to be a teacher, act as a teacher, and then the next thing you know, whoa, and whatever shows up. <laughs> I mean, and then you simply become that teacher because you're going to meet people and volunteer and then put yourself in that position. Same thing as a nurse, same thing as a college student um, graduating from college. All of that is the hypocampus thinking. It's taking you from where you once were into where you're trying to go. So what I want to share that the only thing I'm seeing on the docket right now is a new trial. So I don't know if they're getting ready to create a new trial for the oppositions of everything that is going on with Robert Sylvester Kelly right now. So I suppose that we should be hearing something in the upcoming days on the docket. Until then, I want to take this moment and get your responses from a, a um, biography that I found on the internet and it's about the young wife of Marvin Gaye. Now we all know Marvin Gaye was this wonderful R&B singer who had a lot in store for his life. He was very, very prominent. And, you know, I look at the wife of Marvin Gaye and I see Aaliyah. I see Aaliyah um, maybe reincarnated, you know what I mean? Um, but I want to share this with you because I think it is extremely important. Extremely. Here we go. Wife of Motown soul singing legend Marvin Gaye passed away at the age of 66. She died without much fanfare from the press, with most outlets that chose to report on it reporting the story five days or more after it happened. According to Janice's family, she died at her home in Rhode Island, and no cause of death was released to the press. The singer and actress Nona Gay is the daughter of Marvin Gaye and Janice. Here is a statement that she made to the media after her mother's passing. Quote, From the time she met my father, she was exposed to the way he saw this world was aching, and she did her best to preserve his legacy as he was taken from us far too early. She took every moment to speak about every word and every note of his music, and she wanted to make sure everyone knew the man she fell in love with. I will never get to see her again in this life, but know she's in heaven with my father. 
and a spokesperson for us in spirit. Now I have to stop there and I have to give honor to Robert Sylvester Kelly's three children because this is where they're going to now have to pick up the torch of the legacy of Mr. Robert Sylvester Kelly as he's fighting through for his freedom. And um, so Marvin Gaye's daughter had to do the same exact thing. May her mother rest in peace, um, Janice, and uh, may her father, Marvin Gaye, rest in peace. Um, this is going to be a very um, extreme uh, interview about Marvin Gaye. These are things that I had never heard about. Um, so I just want you to know that our ancestors are not perfect. We're not perfect when they walk the human walk, but we, we just must just show love and show grace. So let's keep going. End quote. And I think that this is really telling and speaks to the fact that Janice never got to live her life as just Janice once she became the underage girl who was attached to a very grown Marvin Gaye. Even after their divorce, and even after his death, she remains Janice Hunter, the second wife of Marvin Gaye. Even in the way that her daughter spoke about her, well, she did get to do some things on her own terms, as I discussed in this video that was originally called Marvin Gaye tortured his teen wife, so she cheated on him with two R&B stars. I hope that you enjoy it. I hope that Janice Hunter finds peace. Yes, and this video is coming from Hot Mess History. And if you look that up, you can go and find a lot of things that um, this interviewer, this content creator has put out there. Um, and I'm so thankful for her for putting this together, this biography of both um, Janice and um, Marvin Gaye. So I just wanted to say that. In the afterlife. When Marvin Gaye met his second wife, Janice Hunter, she was only a teenager, 17 years old and still in high school. Marvin was 34 years old and still married. He was married to his boss's sister, Anna Gordy. She was the older sister of the founder of Motown, Barry. Annie Gordy. That's Barry Gordy's sister, cousin or something. And, you know, it's really ironic that everybody in Motown and, and uh, when R. Kelly was out there in the music industry, you know, everybody stays so connected to what Barry Gordy seemed to have wanted. Um, or no, not Barry Gordy. I'm thinking of Aaliyah's um, uncle, Hankerson. I'm thinking of him. But Barry Gordy, you know, Gladys Knight was part of Motown, okay? And that's how Barry Gord, uh, um, Hankerson got involved in, too, you know, and that's how R. Kelly possibly was supposed to be in that crew, but somehow or another, he never made it to that realm of the musical industry. But back to Marvin's wife. I think that we can all agree that that's not the most conventional way to start dating someone. But if you think that's something, wait till you hear the rest. Drugs, infidelity, crazy times with big time stars. Nothing about Janice and Marvin Gaye was conventional by the standards of the 1970s or even today in 2021. If you like these videos of Janice Hunter is the woman who will become Marvin Gaye's second wife. But before she became his wife to endure pain at his hands, she suffered a lot of childhood trauma first, thanks to her neglectful parents. Janice Hunter was born on January 5th, 1956 in Los Angeles, California. So she's a goat. She's just like Robert Sylvester Kelly, born the same in the same month at days earlier. And you know, um, yeah. They say that girls tend to marry some version of their fathers. Well, as it turns out, her own father was a successful black American music artist, Slim Gaylor. He was a jazz singer and songwriter, and he played many instruments. He was sometimes called McFowdy on stage, and he developed his own language for stage shows called 
without a reading. He even went as far as writing a dictionary for it. In addition to English, he spoke Spanish, German, Greek, Arabic, and Armenian with varying degrees of fluency. His career really took off in the late 1930s, and by the 1940s, he was performing with Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. But he didn't seem to have anything to give his daughter, from what I have read. Janice didn't even get his last name. Janice Hunter got her last name from her white mother, Barbara Hunter. Barbara came from a middle class background, so it would seem that she had something to offer her child. Well, Janice's black father made Janice's mother a single mother, and though California was a liberal place in 1956, it was just not acceptable for a white woman to have a biracial child out of wedlock. So Barbara sent her daughter off to live in an unlicensed foster home. There were an unlicensed foster home. That sounds a lot like, you know, um, in Robert Sylvester Kelly's case, you know, everyone sending their teenage daughter over to his studio. It seems so, you know, the connections and the comparisons, the hippocampus is just like really, really opening up in my mindset right now about the two um, relationships of these wonderful, you know, superstars that we once knew for great, great music and who we still know as great music. We're not going to take this away from them. We're not going to take their history, their art, their culture away from them. Um, just choices, choices is what it was all about. Or does it? Hi, my name is. And right now we're doing a, um, commercial. And so basically what I want to know is how are you feeling Kelly nation about the connection between the two? foster home. There were a dozen other children in that unlicensed foster home, and there, Janice was frequently subjected to mental, physical, and sexual abuse, almost as in some sick way to prepare her for her future with Marvin Gaye, for with him, she would endure much of the same. When Janice Hunter was 14, she was finally allowed to leave the repulsive children's home and move in with her mother, who had abandoned her shortly after she was born. Sometime after moving in with her mother, she met Ed Townsend. He was dating her mother, and he was also a music producer and the co-writer of Let's Get It On by Marvin Gaye. He is the man who would introduce her to Marvin Gaye just a few years after she left the orphanage. When Janice was 17, she was finally able to get that introduction to Marvin Gaye. Ed Townsend took her to the music studio during one of Marvin's recording sessions, and Marvin and Janice fell for each other instantly. It didn't matter that he was literally twice her age. She was 17, and he was 34. And apparently, it didn't matter that he was married, and married to Anna Gordy, of all people. If that would have mattered to anyone, it should have mattered to Marvin, his being a major artist on the Motown label, and her being the sister of the founder of Motown. So what next? It's time for some divorce, depression, drugs, and adultery. Janice teamed up with David Ritz, the author who wrote Divided Soul, The Life of Marvin Gaye, in order to get this story told. By the way, I referenced this book in my previous video about Marvin Gaye called Marvin Gaye Slept With His Teenage Niece and She Had His Child. If you haven't already seen that video, you can check it out here. But stay with me for now, and let's take a further look into the depths of Marvin Gaye's sexual depravity with his teen wife. When so, this is a normal way of look between drugs, sex, money, and fast life. This is what most musicians were dealing with during this time. And they fell into the trap that they didn't even know was there. I mean, you know, you think about Marvin Gaye, it was all about sexual healing. So he was talking about sex. You think of Robert Sylvester Kelly, you know, he's talking about the emotional parts of life. And don't forget, when we go into the eye of consciousness and to the realm of the hippocampus, we're thinking 
specifically of emotion. We're thinking of what drives, what makes us who we are emotionally. So what made these men decide that they would talk to someone younger than someone older? You know, why didn't Mar why was Marvin Gaye talking to a 17 year old girl who was connected to his future money? I mean, was it a, was it just something that was thrown up, thrust upon him because it was something that was supposed to happen and they just, you know, put her there just like some of the parents who put, uh, you know, these young girls in front of Robert Sylvester Kelly to, you know, enhance their career, to make their career more productive, et cetera, et cetera. So again, who is at fault when we look through the eye of consciousness? Who is at fault? And that's why I wanted to share this, this audio with you because it's so personally important to connect it, you know, to the way that the history of music is in the industry of America, especially R&B, rhythm and blues. Here we go. Ed Townsend, Marvin's music producer, brought Janice to the studio for the first time to see Marvin record. She felt a multitude of feelings as she laid eyes on the man whom she had adored since she was eight years old. One of the things she explicitly... Doesn't that sound familiar? Aaliyah, very young, was introduced to Robert Sylvester Kelly for music industry uh, support. And she knew him. She loved his music. Her mother loved his music. Everyone was in, impressed by the music and not realizing that this musician is a man behind the scenes. Um, not saying that anything took place that, you know, I wasn't there to know 100%. However, that's not the point of this video. This video is to just um, just to acclaim that these things happen in the history of music. And it's really, really sad how it is hooked up, how it is maintained. What are your thoughts? Wrote about seeing and hearing Marvin Gaye for the first time was that, quote, his sound erased all pain, end quote. And knowing what we know about her background, I can see why that would draw her to him. Lots of 17-year-old girls have crushes on grown celebrity men, but they rarely meet these men. What I can't understand was why Marvin Gaye, as a grown man, felt so free to publicly express how he felt for her. Knowing that he had the responsibility of a wife and a son at home, Plus, his in-laws were basically holding the strings to his money and his career. So Marvin started the 17-year-old Janice off as his mistress. Marvin took Janice to an Italian restaurant and bribed their waiter with $20 to serve his underage girlfriend alcohol. Just for fun, if you remember who your first celebrity crush was, write it in the comments. I'd love to see those names. Anyway. Not long after, the very grown Marvin Gaye was having sex with his teenager in his one-bedroom apartment, which boasted little more than a couch and a junkie named Abe who lived on said couch. According to Marvin, this junkie was his assistant. Clearly, the teenage girl was so overwhelmed by the thought of being with Marvin Gaye that she wasn't aware of signs that would have been obvious to a lot of grown women. A lot of grown women, not all. After all, he was Marvin Gaye. Marvin was having sex with her every chance he got. And one thing that she was able to see was that Marvin Gaye was intentionally trying to get her pregnant. And Janice did write that she was not trying to prevent a pregnancy. Like any 17 year old girl would have thought, Janice saw that they were in love. But it didn't take Janice long to learn that Marvin was in something but it wasn't feeling like love, more like jealousy and controlling behavior. Marvin tried to convince Janice to drop out of high school so that they could spend their days and nights together. He even offered to be her teacher, telling her, quote, I can teach you everything you need to know. I'll be far more loving and patient than whomever the school provides, end quote. Though it would be bad enough if having all of the time of a high school girl was his only motive, 
it wasn't. Y'all, did you know now, that more than 34 million Americans qualify for see here, so while we're waiting on that commercial, this is getting deep. It's getting very, very deep. Um, I didn't know this about Marvin Gaye. Um, but again, this is what we realize when we say that a musician is only a man, only a woman, you know, but, oh, Janice has gone through a lot already and we haven't even hit the midpoint of her life. So let's listen. Marvin was jealous of the young boys her age and according to Janice told her, I don't want to share you. There are all those strapping young high school football players looking to love on you. They're my competitors. The longer Janice stayed in this relationship, the more ugly sides she saw in Marvin. She began to see that he thrived on emotional and mental turbulence of the people closest to him. Emotional turbulence. And this is the thing that the hippocampus puts into our mindset, especially when we use the ego to equip the mindset to be controlled by what the hippocampus wants to hear, the sensitivity of what it wants to recognize in its, in its wake of, you know, uh, moving beyond and being higher thinking. So you take that ego up there to the hippocampus, that's just like a big bully coming to a college class, um, a campus, and he's been a bully in high school, but now you're up here with people who think and, and can connect to you. So, so it's just, it's really sad how this came to be. It's really, really sad. So he would create situations around those people that would give him a front seat, their emotional distress. Janice recalled Marvin picking her up from school and casually mentioning that he needed to make a stop. That stop was to go to his wife's house to pick up his son from her. While he went inside to get his son, Janice stayed in the car, scared. She was young, but she knew that Marvin was this lady's husband. Well, it didn't matter that Janice stayed in the car, because Anna Gordy, his wife, came outside to see just who her husband was ditching her for. Anna approached the car and ordered Janice to roll her window down. Janice basically cracked it about an inch, and I don't blame her. According to Janice, Anna said to her, I just want to see what someone like you looks like. Mm. From there, she turned her attention to Marvin and told him, Now that I've seen it, don't ever bring it back here again. That was probably one of Janice's less complicated situations with Marvin. Shortly after this incident, he got her pregnant. Marvin kept expressing his joy at the son that they were going to have never acknowledging that it could be a girl, even when Janice mentioned that possibility. Janice ended up having a miscarriage of her first pregnancy. Marvin helped her by saying that, quote, next time, God will bless us with a healthy boy, end quote. When Janice was 18, Marvin turned her into a full-blown teen mom concubine. He was still married to Anna Gordy when Janice gave birth to their first child in 1974, a daughter named Nona. Janice apologized to Marvin for having a girl, as if it were her fault. The amount of mind control that he seemed to have over Janice was as amazing as it was sickening. From there, this 35-year-old adult went on to criticize his teen girlfriend about the stretch marks that were now on her body from giving birth to his child. Janice recalled that he commented to her saying, surely there's a way to rid yourself of those things. Even with the harsh criticism of her new mom body, Marvin Gaye still found it in him to make Janice a teen mom once again the very next year. This time, they had the son that he was waiting to be blessed with, Frankie. Now, Marvin and his new family could settle into family life, if you could call it that. Frequent visits from Parliament and Funkadelic members George Clinton and Bernie Worrell to play basketball and drop acid with Marvin Gaye. 
Invitations to Ike Turner's studio, where he was known to carry around his coke supply in a suitcase. And at home, Marvin writing and producing music while Janice watched. This is why I say R. Kelly escaped the drugs and the, you know, especially in the 70s, it was so much harsher for those people in the realm of R&B, just like James Brown in the 50s. And you know what I mean? It wasn't as prominent back then, but I think he was even involved in it. You know what I mean? It was like, in order to be a musician at this time in the realms of R&B, you had to, it, 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 it was all about sex, money, and drugs, you know? And they both stayed high on pot and coke. If that was everyday life at the gay residence, you can only imagine what a night out must have been like. In her memoir, Janice recalled her first time being prodded by Marvin Gaye to get it on with a random couple. By this time, she had already had his two children, but they were not yet married, so she would have been 19 or 20 years old. He would have been 36 or 37. She and Marvin and this random couple had all been smoking pot and snorting powder together. Then Marvin noticed that the couple was checking out Janice. She said that Marvin told her, quote, I think that they want to take this party to the next phase. A small, intimate orgy is just what the doctor ordered, end quote. Apparently, he was that doctor who ordered this. He didn't physically participate, but he told everyone what to do and watch with pleasure and joy. Marvin was a voyeur who enjoyed watching his teen wife have sex with other people, even if she did not enjoy it. When it was over, he asked Janice, You loved it, didn't you? She answered, Wow, what do you think she answered? You know, this was his, this is his ideas. You know, this young girl was involved in just probably being with him and only him. Here we go. She answered, not especially. He replied, oh dear, please don't deny it. You were an animal in heat. You couldn't get enough. This was your dream come true. She replied, not my dream, Marvin, yours. The very next night, the couple returned looking for more, but Marvin's joy and pleasure didn't return. It turned into jealousy. He told Janice, you go off with him if you want to. I can't stop you. I won't try. Of course, Janice refused the couple because she never wanted to participate in the first place. She did it to please Marvin, who was pleased at first, but after she told the couple to leave, Marvin started up with his mind games again. He told her, to watch purity turn to perversity is a fascinating thing. You were once my angel, and now you have fallen. And yes, I do admit, it is exciting to watch you fall. Hmm. I can only imagine how she must have felt, as the teen mother of his children, who only wanted to please him. Then Marvin started putting Janice in freaky situations with his show business friends and enemies. Janice wrote about a couple of evenings with Richard Pryor that were relatively mild for the couple. She and Marvin partied with Richard Pryor, who invited them one night, quote, to watch bikini-clad dancers having sex with each other. She wrote, the evening was uncomfortable for me, but I went along with the program. During another night with Richard Pryor, he, quote, got so coked up that he hit his wife over the head with a bottle of wine and called everyone at the table a fucking whore, except me. Marvin laughed and said, I should be flattered, end quote. Then there came a time that Marvin tried to get Janice to have sex with Frankie Beverly, the lead singer of Maids. Janice saw that Marvin had developed a habit of steering her toward other men. Sometimes he seemed to do it out of a perverted delight from seeing her with other men. Other times, it seemed to be out of a weird need to create a scene that would stir up his own jealousy. Recognizing a chemistry between Janice and Frankie Beverly, Marvin did everything he could to set up a sexual encounter between the two of them. Finally, he had his chance when one day, Frankie Beverly came for a visit. 
Marvin not only booked a room for Frankie at a local hotel, but booked the adjoining room for Janice, pretending that he needed her out of the house so he could focus on music. On that awkward day, Frankie, Beverly, and Janice Gay did see each other at the hotel. They were both well aware of the uneasiness about the whole situation, but that didn't stop them from smoking pot together in Janice's room. Eventually, there was a loud bang at the door. Of course, it was Marvin, hoping to catch his wife having sex with Frankie Beverly. But Frankie crawled back into his room on his hands and knees, and Marvin, to his dismay, found his wife alone. Marvin wasn't able to get the satisfaction of seeing his wife have sex with Frankie Beverly on that day, in the trap that he set up, but Janice made it clear that at another time, and on her own terms, she did have sex with Frankie Beverly. Marvin was still being cruel to her, but she wasn't quite ready to end it with him. Right after she and Marvin got married, he was telling her that he loved her, but he wasn't in love with her. Marvin Gaye, now almost 40, carried on with complaints about his wife's body, her sagging breast, and her stretch marks. He told her, quote, There's a big difference between pleasure and excitement. As a man, I can't help but seek excitement. End quote. She would turn a blind eye to his infidelities. That was just the way it was. He cheated. She kept her mouth shut. She wrote that at the age of 22, she was, quote, convinced that I had lost my youth forever, end quote. He really seemed to get enjoyment out of talking to her in ways that would make any wife feel insecure. He loved doing things to her that would cause her to question his intentions. For instance, when it came to a family vacation, Marvin left Janice and the kids behind on a planned trip for the family to Hawaii. He flew there ahead of them, then called to beg her to show up with the kids. And for the next few years, that's how Marvin would do their vacations. Plan the trip for all of them to travel together, then leave them all behind and beg them to join him later. After so everybody's been asking me how I got this card that has $540 on it. And they were... So uh, that is about all I want to share tonight with... Um with you regarding the Marvin Gaye biography. And if you want to listen to more about it, um, it just goes on and on. Um, it's the rest in peace, peace RIP to Marvin Gaye's teen wife, Janice Hunter Gaye, her life, her marriage and affairs with stars and death. And I mean, I, I, we can go on and on and on with this. I think that Marvin Gaye did try his very best to, you know, uh, intimidate her to be less, you know, his hippocampus was way up there with his ego and with the drugs that was involved in it, it made his eye of consciousness way less than what it should have been. But the reality of it is that Janice, um, Somehow or another, I guess she just didn't feel that she had what it took in order to make better decisions for her own, you know, sexuality, why she would have to go to be with this one and to be with that one. And then at the end, um, you know, it was Rick James that brought her out of her addiction and into sobriety. And, you know, um, you know, Rick James and Tina Marie, you know, um, that was a whole nother, uh, you know, affair that turned into something that was um, aggressive and addictive and all of that other stuff. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. I just don't know why I connected the two, Marvin Gaye and the relationship with Janice to how I see Robert Sylvester Kelly and the relationship with Aaliyah. Um, I don't believe that he was as uh, abusive in the way, but there is something that we can tie into the reality of a person who, you know, is more mature in that hippocampus area and arena than someone who is in the consciousness of, you know, not even 
consciousness, the unconsciousness of stability, just becoming who they are, you know, and I think that could be a process of why men choose to like younger girls when they're older because they're easily to mold them and like you could see in Janice's situation God rest her spirit is that um she was easily to be persuaded um even all the way down to the very first sexual encounter with the two people that came to the house so these are things that I just really want Kelly Nation to bring out um, as we wait on the appeal process to come, this process is a very long, lengthy, stressful, strenuous time because there could be continuances for up to years, you know what I mean? And, um, and, and we pray that that does not happen to Robert Sylvester Kelly yet. We really don't know. So with that, I would like to thank you for commenting, sharing, subscribing, and even um, putting your information in the chat as we listen to this premiere. It is going to air on tomorrow, which is the winter solstice Wednesday at 6 p.m. And I will be on Sunday. And Sunday will be Christmas Day, okay? But I don't celebrate Christmas Day on Christmas Day. I don't celebrate Christmas really at all. I just celebrate the embracing of the winter solstice. And so anyway, on that day, we're going to be talking about um, the differences between the rim, the um, rapid um, eye movement, and the in. REM, the non-rapid eye movement. And this is what we do in our conscious awakeness of our sleep state. So we're going to go in and we're going to look at rituals that we create and tell our minds in the conscious, in the unconscious world when we're asleep, what to see in our vision when we're awake. And that's coming up. Um, and it's going to be belief in self card number seven. And we're going to get really deep into that on Sunday. So I'm going to do some research on that and really get into what I was thinking when I created that, that area of belief in self, because I think what we tell ourselves before we go to sleep is just as strong as we tell ourselves when we're either in fear or when we're actually not in fear or happiness or whatever it is, when we wake up to whatever takes place in our our day. So I thank you again for being a part of our Kelly Appeal TV. As always, keep it 100 and we will see you next time.